<sighs> so I thought to myself about this title, still falling in love with the broken world. And I think that all of you who know anything about poetry and, and my connection with poetry and um, <laughs> I, I write a lot of love poems and that hasn't changed. Um, although I think as also most of you know that eight months ago, my beloved son chose to take his own life. And after that, I am even more certain <laughs> that love is the only thing that will save us, that love is everything. And so although it may not be unusual for me to be leading a poetry evening devoted to love, I feel it more profoundly how important it is. Oh, you didn't really think I'd get through this night without crying, did you? So we might as well just start it off right away. Well, um, tonight I have, we'll see how many we have. I have 14 poems to share with you. We'll see how many of them we actually get through in the next 45 minutes. And if you have at any time uh, something that you want to ask in real time, go ahead and put it in the chat bar and hopefully we'll have some time for questions and responses at the end also. But mostly what will happen is I'm going to share all these poems that somehow touch on how the world <laughs> is broken, that's just the truth, and how in light of this brokenness, we continue to fall deeper in love with the world, with each other, and with ourselves. And uh, thank you for your note about tears, Janice. <laughs> so after I read each poem, then I'll talk about it just a little bit, and then I'll offer lots of writing prompts for you to do your own writing and launch into your own exploration about falling in love with a broken world. Not only are these poems that I love, they're also poets that I love. And I wanna start with this poem that actually I began with last night also. And I just feel like I wanna shout this poem from the rooftops. It's a poem by Anna Akhmatova, who not only wrote a gorgeous poem, but also lived an extremely admirable life and actually did choose to embrace love and poetry in the face of devastation. Um, Anna Akhmatova, was living in the beginning of the 1900s and she was facing a different war in Russia at the time. Um, she had the opportunity to leave as most of the other literati and uh, intelligentsia were doing um, and chose to stay knowing that she would be persecuted. And she said, no, this is when my country needs me more than ever. And quite honestly, she went from a lifetime of, of writing rather frivolous poems to writing exceptionally necessary poems. Uh, and this is one of them. This poem is, everything is plundered, betrayed, sold by Anna Akhmatova. Everything is plundered, betrayed, sold, deaths, Great black wing scrapes the air. Misery gnaws to the bone. Why then do we not despair? By day, from the surrounding woods, cherries blow summer into town. At night, the deep transparent skies glitter with new galaxies. And the miraculous comes so close to the ruined dirty houses, something not known to anyone at all, but wild in our breast for centuries. That was Everything is Plundered, Betrayed, Sold by Anna Akhmatova. Um, this translation by Stanley Kunitz and Max Hayward. And I think the reason it felt so important for me to share this poem again tonight in this idea of still falling in love with the broken world is that, of course, we are deeply 
together as a, as a globe right now experiencing not only in the Ukraine, but in other places all around the world, these atrocities that are so almost impossible to understand. How could this be happening? And yet it's happening. Um, everything is plundered, betrayed, sold. And then she asks this question, why then do we not despair? I love how the poem turns there. That's that's the changing point, right? She uses a question to help the poem turn. So first she presents, this is what's going so wrong. And then she looks to the natural world to find beauty, to find what is right, to fall in love. And then this line, and the miraculous comes so close to the ruined dirty houses, something not known to anyone at all, something not known to anyone at all, but wild in our breast for centuries. The thrill of this to, to have her acknowledge that if we use the head to try and reconcile, often we'll come up bankrupt. But when we trust in whatever that is that's most feral, that fuse inside us that's somehow miraculously lit, to trust that, that, I think is the path toward falling in love with the world. So as you launch into your, your own writing out of this poem, I, I kind of love just following her little form. She has a stanza in which she writes a lot of things that feel wrong with the world, plundered, betrayed, sold. She asks a question, why then do we not despair? And then the next stanza, she gives us this beautiful description of what is happening in the world around her. Finally, in the last stanza, she talks about what that feels like in the body to be met by the miraculous. This I think is, is the, this giant invitation then to, to write about what is, what is a challenge, to write about what is there to still fall in love with and then to write a stanza about how do we meet it in our own bodies. Um, the next poem is by Martina Espada. Um, he was born in Brooklyn and has been working for social justice and human rights as a poet, an essayist, an activist, an attorney. And, uh, and I kind of love that this poem begins with great cynicism. <laughs> There are reasons why you might be cynical about love as he is in this poem. But then, like any good poem, it turns. This is Love is a Luminous Insect at the Window by Martin Espada for Lauren Maria Espada, June 13th, 2019. The word love, there it is again. Indestructible as an insect fly faster than the swatter, mosquito darting through the net, how the word love chirps in every song, crickets keeping a city boy up all night. I wish I could fry and eat them. How the word love buzzes in sonnet after sonnet. I am the beekeeper who wakes from a nightmare of beehives. To quote Duran, the Panamanian brawler who waved a glove and walked away in the middle of a fight, no mas, no more. Then I see you watching the violinist, his eyes shut. The Russian composer's concerto in his head, white horsehair fraying on the bow, and your face is bright with tears. And there it is again, the word love, not a fly or a mosquito, not a cricket or a bee, but the luna moth we saw one night, luminous green wings knocking on the screen, on the window, as if to say, I have a week to live, let me in, and I do. That was Love is a Luminous Insect at the Window by Martina Spada. Uh, I, I love that he's so cynical about it. <laughs> oh, love. He calls it an insect. And uh, it's so <laughs> uh, it's just 
it pleases me somehow that he's comparing the word love to a mosquito, to a fly that keeps getting through this, to keeps getting through the swatter. And then that turn, just by the way, even so he's complaining about sonnets, this poem itself is written as an what Pablo Neruda might have called a wooden sonnet, which is to say a sonnet that is maybe 14 lines and it has a turn, but it doesn't rhyme. It doesn't have a meter, this one either. But that sweet turn where he goes from, this is all the reasons why I hate the word love. Oh, and this is why it matters. So <laughs> an, an idea for you to launch into your own poem about this. Um, just first of all, you could just write about what is your relationship to the word love. Just write a poem about your relationship to that word. The first time you heard it or <laughs> the millionth time you heard it or when you don't want to hear it or when it drives you crazy or why it's the word that you want to say more than any other. Just write a, write a poem about that. My other idea is to write a poem like Martina Spada that rails against love. Bonus points if you write it as a sonnet. So you can write eight lines about all the reasons the word love drives you crazy. And then six lines about why that word matters. Um, you could also do like he does, he's comparing it to an insect. You could compare it to an insect. You could compare it to animals or just notice <laughs> notice what it is that about that word that pushes you and pulls you in. Um, another one of my poetry heroes is Liesl Mueller. She was born in Germany and her family was forced uh, out of Germany and moved to the United States as refugees from the Nazi regime. And I read an interview with her in which she said, I'm always haunted by the sense that I could have been someone else. Uh, as she says there, but for the grace of God, go I. And, and so that's maybe the premise of this poem about how we might choose to fall in love with our life by imagining we were in a different life. This is called Alive Together by Liesl Mueller. Speaking of marvels, I am alive together with you. When I might have been alive with anyone under the sun, when I might have been Abelard's woman or the whore of a Renaissance Pope or a peasant wife with not enough food and not enough love with my children dead of the plague. I might have slept in an alcove next to the man with the golden nose who poked it into the business of stars or sewn a starry flag for a general with wooden teeth. I might have been the exemplary Pocahontas or a woman without a name weeping in a master's bed for my husband, exchanged for a mule, my daughter lost in a drunken bet. I might have been stretched on a totem pole to appease a vindictive god or left a useless girl child to die on a cliff. I like to think, I might have been Mary Shelley in love with a wrong-headed angel or Mary's friend. I might have been you. This poem is endless. The odds against us are endless. Our chances of being alive together, statistically non-existent. Still, we've made it alive in a time when rationalists in square hats and hatless Jehovah's Witnesses agree it is almost over. Alive with our children who, but for endless ifs, might have missed out on being alive together with marvels and follies and longings and lies and wishes and error and humor and mercy and journeys and voices and faces and colors and summers and mornings and knowledge and tears and chance. That was Alive Together by Liesl Mueller. Uh, what a fun poem. I think so many poems, I, I often you know, talk about how poetry is play. Certainly this is a poem that is just having a really good time. And in this case, she's making a list of all of the things that she might have been if she wasn't herself and allowing herself to fall in love with this life 
by imagining what it would have been like if she'd been in any other life. I mean, especially one where she was tied to a totem as human sacrifice or left alone as a, on a cliff as a useless girl child. Uh, some of these are really, really tough sounding lives. So I love the idea of playing with a list like this of your own. Um, you could start with her, just steal her first line. You can always steal anyone's first line. You can acknowledge them if you keep it. Uh, so let's just take this line, speaking of marvels, I am alive. And now fill in the blank after that. What are all of the ways you could have been alive that you aren't? So um, you could also start with this line, I might have been, and fill in the blank with that. But the thing, the other thing is that this is a poem that's wildly about gratitude. And I, I like that she takes the thing that she's most grateful for, in this case, being alive together. So take anything that you're grateful for and then see if you could write a poem that leads up to what it took for you to have this thing that you're grateful for, whether it's a thing, you know, like you have a home or you're with a person or you, you have this specific child or you have this specific talent, whatever it is that you're grateful for, write the poem that leads up to that being possible in your life. Um, of course, <laughs> I suppose that this poem that she wrote somewhat pre is, is assuming that you absolutely love your life and you feel like you're lucky to have the life you have. Uh, what if you don't feel lucky to have the life you have? Um, that's where we go in this next poem by my friend, Greg Kimura, um, who was a California drummer and poet and an ecstatic ukulele evangelist. <laughs> uh, who also, well, I'll say that, I'll just leave it at that. This is Sacred Wine by Greg Kimura. Sit with the pain in your heart, he said. Hold it like a sacred wine in a golden cup. The wine may break you and if it does, let it. To be human is to be broken. And only from brokenness can one be healed. The ancestors say the world is full of pain and each is allotted a portion. If you do not carry your share, then others are forced to carry it for you. And the suffering you bring to the world is your sin. But the suffering you bring to yourself will be your hell. Sit with the pain in your heart, he said. Hold it there, like a sacred wine in a golden cup. That's Sacred Wine by Greg Kimura. I want to say that, that Greg then was diagnosed with a terminal cancer, and then he died in 2017. And he lived this poem, the end of his life. He met that, all those moments surrounded with music, surrounded with love, insisting on praise. Um, he really did live, live into this poem. I want you to then, as an idea um, for writing your own poem about this, think about some advice you've been given. You can even use this advice that, that Greg has. Sit with the pain in your heart, he said. You could use that line, sit with the pain in your heart, he said, and write a response to that. By the way, you don't have to agree with it. You can, you can <laughs> totally disagree. No, I'm not going to sit with the pain in my heart. Um, Sue Ann, the, this poet is Greg Kimura. It's spelled K-I-M-U-R-A. And um, so one idea, take, the, take this line, sit with the pain in your heart, or any other line of platitude about how we're supposed to meet pain, and, and write a response to it. Um, another idea, though, is just to imagine you're going to do exactly what Greg suggests that you are going to sit there with a the pain in your heart and hold it like sacred wine in a golden cup. What if you do actually drink it? What does it taste like? Write that poem. 
write the poem about actually drinking that sacred wine. Um, another poet hero of mine who's been through a, a really tender, difficult time and met it with astonishing love and grace is Jan Richardson. Her husband and partner died um, in 2020 and she created an entire book of blessings for grief. This one is blessing for the brokenhearted. And she starts with a quote from D Henry David Thoreau, there is no remedy for love but to love more. Let us agree for now that we will not say the breaking makes us stronger or that it is better to have this pain than to have done without this love. Let us promise we will not tell ourselves time will heal the wound when every day our waking opens it anew. Perhaps for now, it can be enough to simply marvel at the mystery of how a heart so broken can go on beating. As if it were made exactly for this. As if it knows the only cure for love is more of it. As if it sees the heart's sole remedy for breaking is to love still. As it trusts that its own persistent pulse is the rhythm of a blessing we cannot begin to fathom but will save us nonetheless. It's by Jan Richardson, Blessing for the Brokenhearted. Wow, I remember the first time I read this poem and I, I saw these lines, let us agree for now, we will not say the breaking makes us stronger. And I think of all of the, the things that we'd say to each other when somebody's going through a hard time and we so desperately want to fix it for them. We so desperately want them not to be hurting. Why? Because we love them. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> we can say some really crazy things to each other like, well, the breaking makes you stronger. Nobody hurting wants to hear that. Oh, well, it's better that you loved than you didn't love at all. No, you don't want to hear that either. <laughs> Maybe you do. So one idea I have about writing your own poem is to think of a line that you've said to someone or that someone else has said to you, something you said with the intention of easing their pain. And like she does, you could even start with her line, let us agree for now that we will not say, fill in the blank. And then, you can explore what it feels like when you hear that, but you could also explore then, what do you wish people would say? Is there something you think is the right thing to say to you, to you? Is there something that people could do instead of saying anything? And you could write a poem about that. So you can start with, please don't say this, please say this, or please do this. Um, how do we really show love? Is there a way? Is there a roadmap? Do you know from your own experience? You could also write this as a wondering. What if I said this? What if you said this? It doesn't have to be, for heaven's sakes, it's all different. Every single situation so different. My other idea for this is to write your own blessing for the brokenhearted. It could be for someone who you know and care about who's brokenhearted, a blessing for them. It could be for yourself, a blessing for yourself, the brokenhearted. What do you wish for that person? Or as it may be for yourself, write that poem. Um, one of my most favorite poems of all, I probably, <laughs> I overshare this poem, I suppose, except that I just, freaking love it. It's The Thing Is by Ellen Bass. And um, in this poem, it seems to me that she really does find a way for what we might do when we are brokenhearted. The thing is to love life, to love it even when you have no stomach for it. And everything you've held dear crumbles like burnt paper in your hands your throat filled 
with the silt of it. When grief sits with you, it's tropical heat thickening the air, heavy as water, more fit for gills than lungs. When grief weights you down like your own flesh, only more of it. An obesity of grief. You think, how can a body withstand this? Then you hold life like a face between your palms, a plain face, no charming smile, no violent eyes. And you say, yes, I will take you. I will love you again. That's The Thing Is by Ellen Bass. Oh, I think one of the reasons I love this poem so much is because she really goes into what it feels like in the body to experience devastation, to experience brokenness. <laughs> when grief weights you down like your own flesh, only more of it, an obesity of grief. And that feeling, how can a body withstand this? This poem, by the way, is, is also set up very similarly to, to the sonnet that we looked at earlier by Martina Spada, in which she begins with something very difficult and ends with a gentle response. So an idea then for writing your own kind of poem that allows you to both honor the deep grief, the deep brokenness, and to honor the potential to still love life. What if you do that? What if you write into what it feels like in the body to experience brokenness this way? And then create a ritual of your own for how you might continue to fall in love with the world. Such a beautiful, tender ritual, she suggests, just to hold life like a face and to say, yes, I will love you again. Just that one word, that willingness, yes. Yes, I will love you. Yes, I will take you. I will love you again. My other idea for, for doing your own writing, leaping out of this poem is to actually do what she suggests. Now, it's funny to me that I've always somehow pictured in this poem that she's holding her own face. She says, take life by the face and do this. I've always imagined her holding her own face. I suggest you try this to hold your own face and look in the mirror. It will be painful perhaps, but you do this and you say to the mirror, if you can, yes, I will take you. I will love you again. Write about that experience. Can you do it? Are you able to say it? How does it feel when you say that? How does it feel when you do that? And if you can't do it, write about that. I can't do that. I can't take my, I can't hold my own face and say that. I can't do it. But interestingly enough, I, I was listening, or I guess I was reading someone else's response to this poem in which they thought that she was holding the, like the face of a child. And I was like, wow, imagine that. It didn't, it didn't have to be holding your own face. You could imagine holding someone else, a beloved's face and saying, yes, I will take you. I will love you again. Either one, try either one and write into that, write into that. I so love when I think I know something about a poem and then something opens up and I get to read it anew. Uh, this next poem is about falling in love with something broken and just allowing yourself to be deeply in love with it, broken as it is. And this is in fact, my poem, and it's called Temple. Oh body, cracked bell that still sings when struck. Oh leaky cup, oh broken stem. I love you, body. Your crooked path, your crumbling walls, your faulty math. I love the way you stopped believing you could ever 
hold it all. How you began to let yourself become the one who is being held. I love the graffiti on your inner halls, scrawled names of all who shaped you. Oh, body, my wreck, my holy glove, my street-worn soul, my crumpled page. Forgive me for years of trying to fix you, for believing the fable of the whole. You, my perfect, wounded heart my stuttered him, my sacred begging bowl. That was Temple, and it's going to be coming out in a beautiful little journal called Stone Gathering. If you are not yet a subscriber to Stone Gathering, you may want to consider it. Try Googling Stone Gathering. It's a really beautiful quarterly uh, journal of poems and short essayettes, as she likes to call them. So uh, my idea for launching into your own writing about this uh, along these lines is to write a love poem for something broken and to praise it, not to fix its brokenness, but to love it in its brokenness. Could be your body like mine. Um, another one of my favorite all-time poems by Galway Canal. This is St. Francis and the Sow a poem in which he acknowledges that sometimes we need a little help falling in love. And uh, by the way, Julie Cummings just put the stone gathering link in the, in the chat bar. Thank you so much for that, Julie. It says St. Francis and the Sow by Galway Canal. The bud stands for all things, even for those that don't flower, for everything flowers from within of self-blessing, though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch, it is lovely, until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. As St. Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her in words and in touch, blessings of earth on the sow. And the sow began remembering all down her thick length from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail. From the hard spininess spiked out from the spine down through the great broken heart to the sheer blue milk and dreaminess spurting and shuddering from the 14 teats into the 14 mouths sucking and blowing beneath them the long, perfect loveliness of sow. I don't always make it through that poem without crying. <laughs> I... I think one of the reasons I, I didn't always love this poem. In fact, I used to not like it very much. I was like, really, it's a great poem as long as we're talking about all the buds and the flowering from within of self-blessing. And then all of a sudden we get to all this imagery of the sow and the spininess and the shuddering and the blue veins. And I love that now. I love this poem. I, this, is, this is a quote from Galway Cannell, actually. He says, I've tried to dwell on the ugly as fully, as far, and as long as I could stomach it. Because I think if you are ever going to find any kind of truth to poetry, it has to be based on all of experience rather than on a narrow segment of cheerful events. And so here it is the blessing of the sow. I think of it, um, how true it is that we forget our own loveliness and that sometimes it is essential for something or someone else to reteach us that. It will never come from outside, it can't. Um, For, and, and I'm sure you all know this yourself, that if someone tells you, oh my goodness, you're beautiful, but you don't believe it, you don't actually hear what that other person says. 
it takes something, <laughs> here he is, he's actually putting his hand on it and reminding it itself so that it can flower from within of self-blessing. So a couple of ideas I have about launching into your own poem about this. One is to imagine the unlovable parts of yourself being blessed. What or who is going to do that blessing? If you don't know, you could imagine it's St. Francis. <laughs> Why not let him be the one who, who puts his hand on and blesses you? But as in all poems, if it doesn't feel true, then for heaven's sakes, don't write it. Write always the truth of it so that um, if you don't have answers about this, if it doesn't feel like you're beautiful, you could, if you don't believe in your own loveliness, you could write it as a question. What would it take for me to be retaught my own loveliness? Who could possibly be the one to teach me that? What could possibly help me know? Write always the truth, write into the questions. Um, my other idea is to do that blessing yourself on anything around, find something that you find absolutely hideously ugly. And imagine you could do what St. Francis did and put your hand on it and bless it as if to remind it of its own loveliness. See if you can believe it yourself. If you, if you can't, oh, for heaven's sakes, then don't pretend you can. Make sure that you write the truth. I wanted to believe that the tick was lovely, but no, it was not. I've never... All right, you all know about me and ticks, right? Um, well, there's a couple of ideas for that poem. Another way to, do, to fall deeply in love with the world is through gratitude, plain and simple. This is Roske, thank you. If you find yourself half naked and barefoot in the frosty grass, hearing again the earth's great sonorous moan that says you are the heir of the now and gone, that says all you love will turn to dust and will meet you there, do not raise your fist. Do not raise your small voice against it and do not take cover. Instead, curl your toes into the grass. Watch the cloud ascending from your lips. Walk through the garden's dormant splendor. Say only thank you. Thank you. Wow, I mean, Roske is asking a lot of us here in this poem, I think. He's asking for unconditional gratitude. And um, I think that's not easy. But I think that's the invitation of this poem is to write a poem that either go outside or inside, it doesn't much matter, but make a list, make a list of everything that you can sense, what you smell, what you taste, what you hear, what you see, and say thank you for it, if you can. If you can't, then write about that experience, about wishing you were able to say, or, or maybe no, maybe you don't wish. Whatever you write, make sure it's the truth, but explore gratitude with everything that's in your present surrounding. All right, two more poems. Um, <laughs> let's face it, it's easier to fall in love when it's an easy thing to fall in love with. And why not give yourself a simple assignment, like write a love poem for something you really love. Uh, that's part of what happens in this poem by Joy Harjo, who is our present United States Poet Laureate. This is Redbird Love. We watched her grow up. She was the urgent chipper, chirper fledgling flyer, and when spring rolled out its green, she'd grown into the most noticeable bird girl, long-legged and just the right amount of blush, tipping her wings, crest and tail, and she knew it in the bird parade. We watched her strut. She owned her stuff. The males perked their armor, greased their wings, and flew Skyloop missions to show off for her. In the end, there was only one. Isn't that how it is for all of us? There's that one you circle back to for home. This morning, the young couple scavenges seeds on the patio. She is thickening with eggs. Their minds are busy with sticks the perfect size, tufts of fluff like dandelion and other pieces of soft. He steps aside for her so she can eat then we watch him fill his beak, walk tenderly to her and kiss her with seed. 
the sacred world lifts up its head to notice. We are double, triple blessed. That's Redbird Love by Joy Harjo. What a great invitation to write a praise poem that describes something that you really do love. And just to make this slightly harder for yourself, you might choose something that's that's growing around you right now and choose to watch it grow over time. You know, Joy Harjo tells this as a small story of watching this little bird grow and then and then mate and then become a, a, a mother. Um, maybe watch something you care about over time and write a love poem to it, a praise poem for it that explores it in all of its changing details. So the last poem I'm going to share tonight is called The Invitation. And um, I guess I think that it's, when I think about still falling in love with the broken world, I think so much of it is a choice that we make, uh, a choice to see what stories we are telling ourselves about the world and about ourselves, and to know that, especially as writers, we have the power to change that story, to write our story in a way that allows us to be loving, that invites us to fall more in love. And that's what this poem is about. Um, this is one of my poems called The Invitation. Two nights after he died, all night I heard the same one-line story on repeat. I am the woman whose son took his life. The words felt full of self-pity, filled me with hopelessness, doom. And then a voice came a woman's voice just before dawn, and it gave me a new shade of truth. I am the woman who learns how to love him now that he is gone. It did not change the facts, but it changed everything about how I met the facts. Over a hundred days later, I am still learning what it means to love him. How love is an ocean, a wildfire, a crumb. How commitment to love changes me, changes everyone, invites us to bring our best. Love is wine, is trampoline, is an infinite song in which I am sung. I am the woman who learns how to love him now that he is gone. May I always. May I always be learning how to love like a cave, like a rough-legged hawk, like a sun. Oh, that was the invitation. Well, if you've ever <laughs> been with me in a program before, you know that um, invitation is, of course, my favorite word. <laughs> I've probably only used it five times tonight, so it had to come back up. And there it is, the invitation to fall in love with the world. And again and again, we have the chance to meet it. And I believe completely that through poetry, through a poetry practice, by deciding that we will be vulnerable and show up and meet the world as it is and see what is happening inside here and meet what is happening outside here and be fearlessly real about it. There's the invitation, friends. That's what it is, to fall in love with the world as it is again and again. So, oh, it's 6.45, which is exactly when I thought we might end, but 
I'm going to stay right here. And if you have any thoughts or questions, suggestions or responses, um, I would love it if you would write them in the chat bar, or you could also use the Q&A and um, we could just have a, a small conversation. <laughs> rather one-sided, I suppose, since <laughs> I'm the only one you're able to see, but I would love to read your question out loud and respond to it if you have one. Um, oh, Emily says, the invitation to further love accepted. Thank you, ongoingly. Thank you, Emily. And Sue Ann also says, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Jan Falls. Thank you. Thank you, Julie Cummings. <laughs> Thank you for the thank yous pouring in. Um, again, you will be receiving an email that has all of these poems so that you are able to see them in print. And when you get the recording, I think it's a nice way to have a little private poetry session right there in your own home. You can just put me on pause at any point and launch into your own writing and start it back up whenever you're ready to do some more, some more writing. I'm just gonna read through the chat and see if there are any questions. Oh, good, Kristen ended up writing some of the chat, <laughs> writing some of the prompts and uh, made a Google doc to show you. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen, that is exceptionally helpful. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> oh, here's a sweet quote from Geraldine Pelican. We are put on earth a little space to learn to bear the beams of love. Thank you for that, Geraldine. Thank you, Cindy, for your lovely comment. I'm so grateful to everyone for showing up. Such a blessing to be here with you and um, to share this evening. I want to thank Shift again. Oh, thank you, Mariah. Thank you for thank you also, Mariah, for I saw that you were putting links to some of the poems in the chat bar. I sure appreciate that. Um, oh, Suzanne writes, I love your poems and your courage to face your heart, full or broken. However, I wind up feeling I am maudlin when I indulge my grief. Maybe that's not a question. Yeah, but I totally get that. <laughs> are, are we maudlin when we indulge our grief? Oh, well, isn't it something to notice that that's a feeling that shows up, right? Um, I guess I would say this. There are so many ways to do it right. And if we are meeting our grief with curiosity um, and we do it again and again and again, um, I think that there's always a gift for us in that. Um, maybe an invitation to write to the parts of ourselves that feel like, really, you're writing about grief again? Um, maybe write a poem to that voice <laughs> and uh, give it, a, just have a little conversation with it, see what it has to say to you and see what other parts of yourself might have to say back to it. Oh, Kim says, during this thought shop, a mockingbird is sat outside my window, trilling his fervent song, regardless of the world events in praise of what is. Thank you for that, Kim. What a sweetness. Thank you, Carol, for your note. Uh, let's see, Kristen says, I'm wondering if it is about permission to write, even if it feels modeling. Yeah, I mean, there it is. And who is it that gives us the permission? Well, there's a question for you. Um, well, thank you, friends. Um, I appreciate you. I'm grateful to be with you. And uh, this is going to be an, a monthly occurrence for the next five months. We'll be doing these thought shops, thought shops on Wednesdays with Shift uh, next month. I think it might be grief. But um, I don't recall. You can look at the at the shift uh, the shift page, or you can look on my own website. I don't have it up yet, but I will soon. Um, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, friends. Thank you so much. Big love to you all.